Words such as algebra, algorithm, alchemy, alcohol, coffee, and more derive from Arabic and reflect on Islam's contribution to the West. Yet, in modern times, science and education in Muslim-majority countries are at an all-time low. This is especially true for Arabic nations. Between 1980 and 2000, nine Arab countries, including Egypt and Saudi Arabia, granted a total of 370 patents compared to at least 16,320 by South Korea. To explain this anomaly, we must explore the past. In the previous episodes, we went over the Silk Road, the rationalist Mutazila, the Inquisition of Ibn Hanbal, the decline of the Abbasids, and the formation of the Ashari, who adhered to predestination. We also went over the conquests of the Seljuk Turks, which in the 11th century set the Muslim rulers on a collision course with the Crusaders from Europe. My name is Shirvan and welcome to Caspian Report. If you want to help our channel, visit our crowdfunding platform on patreon.com slash Caspian Report for more information. In the mid-11th century, Sultan Alp Arslan ascended to the throne of the Seljuk Empire. Under his leadership, the Seljuk holdings significantly expanded throughout the area. But inevitably, Arslan encountered Romanos, the emperor of the Byzantine Empire. In the year 1071, the two powers locked horns over the faith of the Middle East. Romanos assembled an army and marched to meet the Turks but in an area called Menzikert, he was caught by surprise. Arslan's forces delivered the Byzantines an irreversible defeat. Not only had the Turks crushed an army that was at least twice their size, but the Byzantine ruler, the most powerful man in the Christian world, was captured alive. Arslan placed his foot on Romanus' neck and humiliated him. Then he raised Romanus from the ground and treated him like a guest. Eventually, after eight days, the Seljuk ruler set his counterpart free. This point in history illustrates how well Arslan grasped the political dynamics. By releasing Romanus, the emperor was humiliated in Constantinople. His authority waned and it triggered a series of civil wars within the Byzantine realm. As a result, most of Anatolia came under Turkish control and in the course of centuries, the population assimilated into the Turkish identity. What's more is that Arslan authorized his generals or atabeys to carve their own principalities throughout the empire. Despite his military prowess, Arslan's reign came to an abrupt end when he was assassinated. His death triggered a succession crisis and the Seljuk houses focused inwards. It is in this period that the Turkish Atabe principalities became virtually independent. Many of these principalities started exercising their sovereignties by attacking one another as well as by harassing Christian pilgrims. At the backdrop of the Seljuk crisis, most of the domestic affairs were left to the local political advisors. In the case of the deceased Arslan, the closest advisor was Nizam al muluk a brilliant figure who wrote the Siyasat Nama, or the Book of the Government, which is comparable to The Prince by Machiavelli. The Seljuk advisor, backed by regional dynasties, nobilities and houses, established the Nizamiya Guild, which were educational institutions that were comparable with European universities. The Nizamiya represented the finest quality of education in the Islamic world, and the most splendid academy was the El Nizamiya of Baghdad. Al Muluk was later assassinated by a member of the Assassins, which was a secretive group that adhered to the Ismaili branch of Shia Islam and used stealth infiltration and political assassinations to wage an asymmetric war against the Sunni Muslim rulers. For the assassins, the death of al-Muluk marked the first of many political assassinations. However, before the advisor perished, he appointed the distinguished Ashari scholar al-Ghazali to supervise the academy in Baghdad. Few could imagine that in time, this scholar would change the fundamental beliefs of Islamic civilization. 
Yet, while Al Ghazali was preoccupied with giving lectures, another major event was about to disrupt the Middle Eastern affairs. By the year 1095, the Byzantines saw an opportunity in the Seljuk succession crisis. The new emperor, Alexius, wanted to strike at the Turks, but his realm was still in recovery, so instead, he appealed to the West European kingdoms for aid. At the time, feudalism in West Europe had created a disproportionate distribution of wealth, power, and knights. For Pope Urban II, a military expedition to the Holy Lands presented an opportunity to strengthen his authority over the feudal kings, lords, and barons of Western Europe. Just as the Jihad was a way to unify the Muslim world, so too was the Crusade a way to bring the Christians together and exert internal force on the outside world. As such, in 1095, Pope Urban II, during a sermon in Clermont, convinced the courts of France, England and the Holy Roman Empire to take up arms and embark on an expedition to Jerusalem. The Pope promised salvation for the participants and the sermon sparked a wave of religious fervor. Inspired knights and lords took upon the cross as their coat of arms and later would be known as the Crusaders. However, before the nobles could gather their numbers, peasants and commoners in Europe assembled their own expedition and marched towards the Holy Land. Yet the careless undertaking of the peasants' army left them ill-prepared for the journey east. During their expedition in what became known as the People's Crusade, the peasants' army looted and pillaged Jewish, Christian and even Byzantine settlements who were supposedly allies. By the time the 20,000-strong People's Crusade reached Anatolia, they were swiftly crushed by the local Turkish nobles. The speed at which the peasants' army was defeated surprised even the local Seljuk rulers, who mistakenly believed that the People's Crusade was the primary fighting force of Europe. The next year, news spread that more Christian armies were coming, but the Seljuk principalities were not impressed. They expected another army of peasants and, in their complacency, made no preparations. At the day of the battle, the Turkish nobles were stunned to see a 60,000 strong, well-trained and well-equipped army. The result was the defeat of the local Seljuks at the Battle of Doryleum, which allowed the Crusaders to march unopposed from Anatolia to the Levant. The Muslim rulers in Damascus, Antioch, Aleppo and Mosul prepared to meet the Crusaders ahead, but ended up fighting one another. Meanwhile, Christian forces conquered city after city, but fighting in a strange land did not always go as planned. In Ma'ara, a city in Syria, a lengthy fight came to an end when the French contingent broke the siege. As the starving French crusaders entered the food-stricken city, they resorted to cannibalism and fed on the dead bodies of people and animals alike. Soon, rumors of invading cannibalistic barbarian armies spread across the region. At one point, the word French literally meant cannibal in Arabic, which illustrates how the locals perceived the Crusaders. Further south in Egypt, Fatimid officials, who rivaled the Seljuks and were allied with the Byzantines, believed that the Crusaders represented Byzantine reinforcements. As such, while the Crusaders conquered Antioch, Fatimid rulers moved against Jerusalem and asserted their control over the city. It didn't dawn on the Fatimids until it was too late that the Christian forces were not allies and were not interested in an alliance. At the turn of the century, in the year 1099, the Crusaders arrived at the gates of Jerusalem and began their assault. Eventually, roughly a month later, the city walls caved and the Crusaders burst into Jerusalem. Fueled by religious frenzy, they went on a rampage and massacred soldiers and civilians alike. None of the city's religious communities fared well. Most of the Muslims were killed straight away while the Jewish population had taken refuge in a large synagogue that was set ablaze. Even much of the Christian segment of Jerusalem was punished and sent into exile because the Catholic Crusaders saw the Orthodox population as heretics. 
the shock and horror of the First Crusade and the fragmented political landscape of the Islamic world deeply distressed Muslim communities across the area. People were in need of divine resolution. And to that end, Ashari scholar Al Ghazali stepped up to the forefront of the debate. The Ashari school of theology believed that reason was subservient to revelation, while the latter Mutazila group adhered to absolute rationalism. Decades earlier, the latter had been banned for political reasons, but pockets of Mutazila sympathizers still existed all over the Muslim world. Al Ghazali believed that violence could not subdue the rival school, it required a battle of intellect. As such, in one of his most acclaimed works, The Incoherence of Philosophers, Al Ghazali attacked scholars of rational thought and argued that rational philosophy was incompatible with Islamic teachings. More precisely, he classified science into three categories. The first, religious studies included jurisprudence, theology, Arabic grammar, etc. The second category included traditional faculties of science such as astronomy, medicine, mathematics, chemistry and others. The final category concerned spiritual and cultural studies such as astrology, esotericism and palmistry. Al Ghazali rejected the spiritual and cultural studies and deemed the study of traditional scientific faculties as useful as long as it was pursued for religious purposes. The first category, however, religious studies, was considered the finest because it brought people closer to God. Although some historians say that Al Ghazali defended reason, the truth is, he did so only to the extent that it could be used as an instrument to undermine his opponents. The weight of Al Ghazali's contributions is emphasized by the fact that many academics consider him as the single most influential figure in Islam after the Prophet Muhammad. Needless to say, Al Ghazali's work sealed the attitudes towards science in Islamic civilizations. The political elites and the common folk endorsed Al Ghazali as the Mujaddid which according to tradition is a person who appears at desperate times to rejuvenate Islam. To that end, the scholar fostered the Ashari beliefs into the mainstream culture. Although Al Ghazali emphasized intellect and denounced violence, his supporters however singled out and condemned great thinkers such as Al Farabi, Al Biruni, Al Rawandi, Ibn Sina and Ibn Rushd. Their studies and properties were confiscated, their teachings were deemed heresy, their achievements were twisted and their books were burnt. Anyone who expressed sympathy with the Mutazila was either imprisoned, tortured or banished. Centuries earlier, the Mutazila had lit the flame of enlightenment and paved the way for a vibrant and innovative community of scholars. Some of the greatest minds in the world came from this movement, but in the 11th century, the Mutazila faded away in the obscure pages of history. That said, as the books of Ibn Rushd were destroyed, he famously stated that ideas have wings, no one can stop their flight. And so while the flame of enlightenment had been extinguished in the Islamic world, European universities established faculties that focused on the translation of Arabic texts, which would help to expedite the scientific findings during the Renaissance. Meanwhile, as the Ashari dogma shifted the mindset of Sunni Muslims, knowledge was seen through the prism of revelation and many turned away from philosophy and the natural sciences. This change, however, was not abrupt. It would take centuries for the doctrines to sink in, but its process was accelerated by the collapse of the Silk Road and a new threat that emerged from the Far East. This was a Caspian Report by me, Shirvan. We will release one more episode for this series just to cover the events of the Mongol destruction. But in the meantime, if you are a student of history or if you enjoy historical videos, check out the channel Kings and Generals. They go into the depth of historical battles with some really good animations. 
The link to their channel will be in the description, so check it out if you're interested in additional sources. Also, special thanks to our contributors on Patreon. Basically, they give us the means to research and produce these reports. If you want to be part of this crowdfunding platform, visit patreon.com slash Caspian Report. In any case, thank you for your time and sarol.